any? Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're delighted to have you all here to discuss how we really accelerate the energy transition. I mean, my name is Ursula Whitburn, and I'm the head of European Relations for the Corporate Leaders Group Europe. We're a group of companies that really believe in and supporting the transition to a sustainable economy, and we're delighted to do this event in conjunction with its partnership with Iberdrola, and also thank you so much to the UNFCCC for all their support in organizing this. We find ourselves in a scenario with a triple threat, threats to our economies, threats to our energy supply, considerations of how we transition to a climate neutral economy. At this point, hopefully we can see some answers in the energy transition, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about that both on the supply and the demand side today. This is an area where there are positive answers, so we look forward to, to seeing that. Um, we are, we'd like to start by Pat. Thank you very much as the Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to hearing your perspective on how the EU is dealing with this right now. It's what we do in the EU will really affect a lot of the countries around the world, and um, there's a lot of exciting new initiatives coming up, so we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this um, uh, event today. Energy markets are upended, and uh, we have seen gas prices in Europe reach record levels. And uh, energy is being scarce in many parts of the world. The heaviest burden is of uh, rising energy prices is falling on the most vulnerable. And the latest IEA World Energy Outlook found out that around 75 million people who recently gained access to electricity will not be able to pay for it. And we have also had a, to fundamentally reassess our energy security risk. Also, uh, in the perspective of uh, security supply after Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. The question that uh, many are asking is uh, whether this turmoil will be a stumbling block or a catalyst for the clean energy transition. But I firmly believe that the latter. In the then diagram, of our changing climate and energy security, there is one common solution in the center, the clean energy transition. Decarbonization has been our guiding star since um, we announced our European Green Deal initiative, and also um, this is the core of our 6 for 55 strategy. And now it will lead our action as part of our response to the energy crisis. The Repower East Plan, our strategy is to become independent Russian energy as soon as possible. For us, this crisis um, can be states that both uh, high and unsustainably volatile energy prices, but also climate crisis, uh, well, we are firmly behind uh, the clean energy transition. And do you think that the um, best route to that zero will depend on the success in three areas? These are renewables energy efficiency and international cooperation. First of renewables. They are key to not overstepping uh, the 1.5 degree target and key for our goal of ridding the EU system of Russian fossil fuels. Renewables are green, they are affordable, they are homegrown. And we aim to increase the share of renewables in our energy mix to 45% already by 2030. No matter how we look at the numbers, um, that is a steep trajectory. To reach it, we have taken um, action in many areas. We have released our first ever EU solar strategy, including a legal obligation to uh, install solar panels on new installations and new buildings. Last month, uh, saw the launch of a new EU solar industry alliance to shape and build a competitive solar industry in the EU. And we are not just paving the way for the industry, we are also removing the roadblocks uh, that are already in place. And this is uh, mainly the issue of permitting and how long it takes. 
renewable hydrogen and biomethane are also uh, uh, venues where we have to well uh, step up because uh, they are green alternatives to the foreign fossil natural gas. And to keep our EU, we are aiming for 20 million tons of hydrogen, both domestic and imported. So we have proposed uh, new 2030 targets for hydrogen consumption, um, finding targets for industry and transport, backed by new hydrogen accelerators to help boost the pipeline of projects uh, coming in. And uh, like for solar energy, we have set up a European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. We are also working closely with industry on a biomethane industrial partnership to help reach 35 billion cubic meters of sustainable biomethane annually within the next eight years. Um, for us, wind energy constitutes um, um, or plays a, a central role in our plans um, um, to upgrade renewables in our energy mix. And there are some key basins in Europe, namely North Sea and Baltic Sea, and countries around uh, the sea basins um, that do commit uh, to impressive and, uh, and very ambitious uh, offshore wind targets both for 2030 and 2050. And we see there that regional cooperation picking up in all the countries is there and we can, we can uh, use this experience for the rest of the sea basins that we do have in Europe. Renewables in every form are taking a leading role in lowering energy prices. And, uh, and they are also securing our energy independence and limiting uh, the effect of uh, climate change. And the second thing that I wanted to mention is energy efficiency, well, saving. And in case uh, for investing in energy efficiency, um, this is now a really um, economically feasible thing to do. Um, and of course, the cleanest and cheapest energy, the energy, the cheapest energy that we don't consume, and, uh, and this is a huge potential for us. Um, in July this year, in the middle of the manipulation from Russian side, we launched our same gas for the winter package. Uh, all our member states agreed that they will cut the natural gas consumption by 15%. And they have done so already in August and September, so this is something that they have to then deliver until the spring arrives and our CCC will be lower. And third and finally, the national cooperation it is not uh, an EU energy crisis that we are facing right now, it's a global one. And climate change is already affecting the countries and people all over the world. So, common challenges, for the common action and uh, common solutions, uh, and the uh, European Green Deal drives our engagement at home and, and abroad, and its principles guide our dialogue with partner countries at the multilateral forum. And since the current energy crisis began, we have strengthened this cooperation. Our external energy Looking strategy is right on our work in the past, um, inclusion, non EU countries and suppliers to help diversify energy supplies and build long term partnerships. And that means that uh, we will look beyond uh, 2030 and uh, we look for the commitment to a global just energy transition and clean transition. Five and we acknowledge our responsibility to help those who find themselves also in vulnerable positions. Um, many so countries energy, are facing uh, even higher prices than Europe, and we have made our commitment to help Ukraine in all situations, but also, also our neighbors in, uh, in Moldova, Western Balkans, Africa, and uh, to ease the impacts of, uh, of the war that uh, Russia launched. And understanding that no country or region can do uh, and face these been challenges been alone should be kept in mind always and put it over climate brutality. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as I see it, three aspects, renewable, energy efficiency and international cooperation are the main tenets for our discussion. And um, with that, I will pass the floor to other respectable panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We'll look forward to hearing more about that during the energy, EU energy day today. Um, so next up, I'd also like to um, welcome Dr. Karen Alex, who's presenting for us.
from a regional perspective is the director of the Regional Centre for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency at the Remain of Essex. So please come up here. Good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies. Thank you very much for having me today. So uh, I'm the executive director of the Regional Centre for Energy Efficiency and Energy Efficiency Degree. We are an intergovernmental organization based in Cairo. We are a technical arm of the Arab, Arab states in all questions related to renewable and energy efficiency. So our main mandate since the beginning of the center is to support the energy transition journey in the Arab region. And also we have another mandate is to promote the investment of private sector in these areas. So in this regard, we supported the development of the sustainable energy uh, uh, Arab sustainable energy, uh, strategy. And then we develop all the action plan, the new energy action plan and the energy efficiency action plan in every uh, member state among the Arab countries. In this regard, obviously, we develop also the monitoring tool and also the assessment tool of how far they are going in their energy transition. Obviously, there are different level of progress. We have countries like Egypt, for example, when it comes to renewable, you saw, I mean, the amount of investment in the last years. We, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in less than 15 years, we pass it from a deficit of electricity and a surplus. Uh, we have new the amount of uh, uh, signing recently, not only in terms of renewable energy project, but also, again, hydrogen and we were signing recently. So, uh, uh, I mean, there is a political will and there is really um, uh, uh, I mean, a good environment for investment, a lot of institutional and legislative and financial measures, incentives have been set up to, I mean, to, uh, to uh, 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 and, uh, allow this, this happen. Obviously, we have ambitious targets in terms of raising the contribution of renewables in the energy mix. In Egypt, we have the target of 42% by 2025. Uh, in Morocco, for example, we have the target of 52% by 2030. So uh, there are lots of reforms that have been uh, uh, done uh, institutionally again at the level of the legislation framework, enforcement, and also at the level of attracting the financing. Uh, we have also the example of Tunisia. They are doing really well in terms of energy efficiency. The solar heaters, for example, and uh, uh, Tunisian and the uh, energy, uh, they did a lot in terms of energy efficiency effort at the domestic level, and uh, also industry, energy auditing. So Rikri has been supporting this effort in the region in particular also to promoting the best practices uh, from a country to another. Also, we were supported by the European Commission uh, uh, in MISMED project. MISMED 1, MISMED 2 now, we are focusing more on energy efficiency in building and appliances. We know that the building sector is contributing by around 59% of the uh, I mean energy emission, I mean the CO2 emissions related to energy. So this is huge, obviously, decarbonizing the building sector is another goal also that we contribute to. We work closely with uh, the Northern African countries with the National Agency for Energy Efficiency, and we are work at level of policies, the marketing of policies, at level of legislation and how to enforce it, but also at level of creating what we call sustainable energy investment platform at national level, at regional level. We gather all the, 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 the stakeholders, the financial guys, the, the local banks, the, 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 all the energy actors at the national level to work closely together. Uh, to work beyond uh, the end of the, the project and to say like a sustainable platform where they can really work, work together. Also at level of capacity building, we do a lot in terms of capacity building. Uh, we receive requests from the member states. We do it, I mean, with ourselves or with third parties like UNDP, UNIDO, for example, in terms of cooperation with UNIDO at industrial level. We manage, for example, in Egypt, uh, the Industrial Energy Efficiency Fund. We work with companies, industry, uh, industries in particular, in order to uh, do energy audits in some companies in Egypt for very successful, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, project. Also, at the green hydrogen, we are, I mean, everyone is talking about. I think the, the, the target is clear that we need to push forward the agenda. We had the conference of NEFED in June with, uh, with the leadership of Germany and Jordan, and we discussed a lot about green hydrogen. Uh, in this regard, I can announce you that uh, we just uh, we got an agreement with uh, 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 the P2X, the International uh, uh, P2X uh, Berlin Hub in Germany to, to, uh, to work together in the next month about some capacity building, preparing guidelines, also working on regulatory framework for green hydrogen in the region. We know that some countries like Morocco, they have their own national strategy. The Egyptian 
we want to visualize it, I think, before the desktop. And some others are also doing, I mean, finding modules like Mauritania, who are big potentially in Oman, obviously in Saudi Arabia and UAE. So all this effort, obviously, we need to try to harmonize and to push forward the agenda. We work closely with Greek Arab State to also build the regional strategy on green hydrogen. Um, so um, what else? Also, in terms of certification, which is also another aspect, important aspect, we do also promote certification, uh, which we call PASEM, Certified Energy Manager Professional Program, we promote it in the, in the region. So de definitely, and directly, we try to work together with also regional players, like OMI, Observatoire, Municipal Engineer 3, and others like UNESCO and Medener, USM, obviously, we are animators together with Medener of the Union for the Mediterranean platform for European energy, energy efficiency. So all with this actor, we try to move forward, accelerate this energy transition, and to see how can we really uh, uh, enable the environment for financing uh, uh, more investment in the, in the uh, renewable energy efficiency in the region to enable this acceleration of the energy transition. But again, there is different level of progress. The countries that have less level of progress, we have mechanisms to support it. Uh, I mean, uh, also using third parties like UNDP, like others. So I don't think we want to be, uh, I mean, to talk further. I mean, uh, I know this agenda is uh, very busy, but thank you a lot for having me. Uh, and I will be happy to respond to any question. And if you can allow me, I will stay just a little because I have another little commitment. But thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sarah. I think we just heard a lot about really exciting initiatives, a lot of different options and a lot of different new ways of, of driving investment into green hydrogen and renewables in, in many different countries. Um, I think with that, we'll head to the panel discussion. And I'm delighted to welcome you there today. Um, we have Gonzalo Simpson Mineiro, the Director for Climate Change at Ibadrola, Dr. Tim Gould, who's the Chief Energy Economist at the IEA, who's the Head of Sustainable Investment at the Danish Pension Fund, Harry Bahar, who's the Vice President um, at Signify, and of course the Commissioner. But um, I'd like to start first with you, Tim. Um, I think we've heard a lot about a lot of the different initiatives happening, a lot of the different energy, but um, how do you see it? I mean, what do you see um, from the IEA's perspective on the implications of the energy crisis? Is it a setback or an accelerant? And how can we reduce the chances of new energy shocks and price volatility as we move to a new net zero emission system? Well, thanks very much indeed, um, Ursula, for that. Um, question and for the chance to, to participate in this discussion. I think when it comes to the implications of today's energy crisis, um, I think we need to separate out short term and long term. Uh, short term, there are clearly trade-offs between energy security and emissions. Um, you see an increase in coal use in some countries. Um, but over the longer term, uh, for us, there's a very strong alignment between the economic incentives, the energy security incentives, and the emissions reduction incentives. And they all point in the direction of an acceleration in transitions uh, for the reasons that our speakers have highlighted. Policymakers are responding. They are seeing how um, clean technologies can help all of the aspects of the energy system that they would like to um, create. Thank you. Um, in our view, that's going to lead to quite a significant uptick in the amount of money going into clean energy transitions over the next decade. So we've been stuck in recent years at around $1 trillion each year going into clean energy technologies and infrastructure. By 2030, in our view, will be closer to $2 trillion. Now, that's very important. That'll change many things about our energy system. It won't, however, get us on track for a 1.5 degree stabilization. So the theme of today's discussion is about a further acceleration is, is incredibly important. And there, I think one of the heartening things that I've seen in the discussions in which I participated at COP is this kind of mutually reinforcing nature of commitments from different actors, where private sector initiatives can, can give confidence to policymakers that it's fine to be more ambitious. And policies can then encourage greater investment and greater action by and the private sector. And I'd like to give a couple of examples. And because in the recent World Energy Outlook that 
uh, we published at the IEA, we looked at the manufacturing pipelines for certain key clean energy technologies. So we looked at electrolyzers for hydrogen production, uh, we looked at solar PV, um, we looked at all sorts of other uh, technologies, but many of them, the, if all of those projects come to fruition, they go well beyond the, sort of, the sum of today's policy ambition. And so it's clear that manufacturers are also seeing opportunities here. And, and that's one reason why we, we do feel optimistic that we will see an acceleration over the coming decade um, in, in the pace uh, of transition. Um, there are all sorts of caveats there about the geographical concentration of some of these supply chains, which, which we need to be very wary of. Uh, but in aggregate, I think there, there's a great chance that if those solar PV modules are produced, they will be used, and they will be used productively to try and to reduce emissions. Um, a final point, though, uh, and th something that we are worried about, is that the increases that we've seen so far in clean energy spend have been geographically concentrated in advanced economies and also in China. And there is a, a real risk, particularly at a time of today's geopolitical upheaval, of new dividing lines around energy and climate. And, and just to say that makes underlines the importance of all of the discussions around climate finance and new bridges across different countries and um, that have been taking place here at, uh, at COP27. Thank you so much, Tim. By the way, I believe we have to always speak quite close to the mic for so the online audio, so just, uh, just to note that. Um, but, um, Gonzalo, uh, moving to you, um, it's great to um, have you here as a company that is really investing in renewables. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the opportunities and the challenges that you are seeing there, what, and also from what you've heard today? I think this point about the, the positive policy loops is really, really important as well. So please go ahead, Gonzalo. And we do have some uh, extra music uh, accompanying <laughs> us. So, I mean, we will keep going and, uh, and it will hopefully give you some, some more inspiration. Go ahead, Gonzalo. Okay, thank you very much, Ursula. Our view is that we are facing several crises at the same time. So we have the climate crisis, the energy crisis, the economic crisis, and the biodiversity crisis. So the origin of all these crises is our energy model based on fossil fuels. And the solution to all of them is to replace urgently fossil fuels with renewable energies and not just at the electricity sector, but in the whole economy. And by doing this, I think we will improve competitiveness, reduce the energy bills, because renewables are the cheapest way to produce electricity all over the world. We will improve industrial development, create sustainable jobs, contribute to energy security, and also protect biodiversity. So, this is a huge opportunity. There are good, good news. Hmm? First is the clean technology revolution, and not just for renewables or clean solutions, heat pumps, batteries, uh, green hydrogen. The energy crisis we are seeing is accelerating the energy transition, not just for climate, but also for energy security. The International Energy Agency predicts that the peak of fossil fuels will be within this decade. So this is really good news. And some firms, we are investing a lot on, in clean solutions. However, it's very clear that we have to, more, to go much faster. So what are the barriers? We have the technology. Firms are ready to invest. The financial sector has an increased interest in investing in clean technologies. What do we need? Four things. I think we still need to promote information and awareness among people. This is the first thing. Second is to set robust policies and regulations that really accelerate the transition and accelerate the transition in renewables, electric cars, heat pumps, green hydrogen, reinforce a uh, regulatory instability. I think it's important that the short-term decisions are aligned with the long-term objectives. 
and streamline administrative procedures. And I want to end up with a thing. I think that the challenge is so huge that we cannot do it alone. We have to collaborate with everyone, with governments, with regions, with suppliers, with environmental groups, and especially in one thing, at least in Europe, is to increase social acceptance for projects, for renewal projects. For... And this is something really important, and we need to put people, local communities, at nature, and nature at the center of our decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Harry, um, if I may move to you from a signified perspective, um, obviously you're focusing a lot more on the energy efficiency side of this um, and really looking at how that can provide some of the quickest emission reduction. What is your perspective? What is missing in the global EU perspective on this? Yeah, thank you, Ursula. So, um, if we look at indeed accelerating action, we need to double the pace of action in every domain of the energy transition. And for good reasons, uh, there's a lot of attention to the supply side. Uh, but then also there's a huge relevance of energy efficiency at the demand side, particularly because that brings results on the short term. Uh, whereas some things on the supply side will take longer uh, to, to grow in scale and impact. And if you then look at energy efficiency, they're actually yeah, next to carbon reduction, to reduction on the, everybody's energy bill. Uh, there's now a third relevance, because if we act on energy efficiency, we can also free up a massive amount of electricity that can help electrifying heating and transport. So where I live in the southern Netherlands, the grid is at capacity. So already thousands of new applications have been denied by the utility because there's not sufficient electricity. And in that, it's, it's useful to realize that in Europe, the average electricity consumption of one household is exactly the same as what one electric vehicle needs per year, and it's about the same as one heat pump needs per year. So you can see, adding up the numbers, that this is a huge challenge, electrification. And even in our sector, so we are the world leader in lighting, I think we are positively known. And so in the last 15 years, the global electricity consumption for lighting has reduced from 19% to 13% last year. We are 85% on our sales of LEDs, so all good news. But, there's a but, and that is that the install base, globally, all light points in the world are still 35% conventional, as they say, bulbs and tubes, and in Europe this is 50%, so Europe is lagging behind, and if you would look at this potential, and if you would transition that, if you would upgrade that to LED, uh, this reduces uh, energy cost by, by, 50, by 65 billion euro, it reduces carbon emissions by 51 million tons, but also, <coughs> the amount of electricity that it frees up would be enough to power 47 million heat pumps. So 47 million households could use that electricity instead of wasting for old lighting to power heat pumps. And that's relevant because a quarter of electricity in Europe is generated by gas, of which we want to reduce, uh, of course, uh, imports. So that is also why uh, yeah, we do a call for action on energy efficiency now in three areas, and I'll give some examples. So for all countries and cities to switch street lighting. One example there, if Germany would only switch their street lighting, they free up electricity sufficient to power 500,000 heat pumps, which happens to be the target for next year. Then buildings, also public and private sector buildings. So there's a lot of energy consumption in public buildings, schools, and public offices. So that, that's actually the largest potential. But then also households. Have you see, um, on average, households still have 10 in, let's say 10 conventional light points, so incandescent, halogen, fluorescent, fluorescent will be banned uh, next year. Uh, but then, yeah, many countries, also my country, the Netherlands, are giving cash to reduce the energy bill, but that's only like, let's say, like a, like a breath of relief, because after that cash, yeah, the next bill is again a high bill. So we would say, and also the IEA please for that, has to give structural measures. So if instead of 100 euros in cash, you would give like 100 euros in LED, the energy saving over five years would be close to 1,000 euros. So that's also a multiplier. And so it takes a little time. It doesn't relieve the first bill, but over time. So I would say that may be ending up. And it maybe sounds a little bit um, uh, yeah, philosophical, but I think energy efficiency is a bit, we see it a little bit as a lottery ticket for Europe. And uh, we should only go to the box office and cash it in. And we can do that. So I would say with all the elements in the energy transition, let's also look at what can we do now and actually what can we do over time 
and, and, and relief things to make it easier for renewables and for the other measures set to, to reach that scale and impact. Thank you, Harry. Well, hopefully it's a winning, winning lot of tickets. Um, I think next we, we have Debbie, who's joining us on the investment side. So it'd be great to hear from you to see what's missing. And we've heard around the economist side, we've heard from the renewables and, and the energy efficiency. How are you seeing the role of collaboration between public finance, private finance, and uh, the public sector and, and investors to, to really tackle this challenge? And then perhaps, Commissioner, it would be great to have some of your thoughts uh, after Debbie has spoken on, on the many, the rich discussion that we've had already. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Ursula. I, I very much concur with, uh, with what has been said so far. Um, PKA is a... Is Sorry, Debbie, could you speak a bit closer? Is it working? Sure. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. I'm representing a, a Danish pension fund uh, who's been working uh, on the green transition for a number of years. Uh, and we do it uh, because we think it's important, but uh, first and foremost, because we can get a good return. As a pension fund, we, are, we have obligations towards our members. Uh, they are the ones who have to be have uh, a pension when they retire. So. We need to have this uh, as some kind of mainstream investments with good returns, with risk mitigation, and so on. So what have we done? We have set a number of targets to increase our green investments from right now 13% to 15% in two years and 20% in, uh, uh, by 2030. Um, we partner up with... Uh, people uh, and companies who know much more uh, about, for instance, uh, renewable energy in Africa, where we are right now. They can help us understand uh, what risks there are, and if we can work together with the MDBs, with the DFIs, like the Danish DFI issue, and have this risk mitigation through blended finance, through some kind of first laws, some kind of guarantee to take the risk, top of the risk, until it becomes mainstream and we can do it ourselves. So that would be a, a catal catalyst for us. And it, it's an extremely important. But I must say, we've got 55 billion in asset under management and uh, we stand ready to invest and we wanted a diversified portfolio also investing uh, in the green transition in, uh, in the countries outside Europe or, or the US where we, where we normally are. Thank you, Debbie. Harry, would you mind, uh Thank you. Commissioner, we've heard an enormous amount from um, people in Paris and, and the, in the MENA region on renewables, energy efficiency, and the investment side. I mean, what's your response to, to some of the points you've mentioned? I mean, what would you be looking for in fact in terms of the private sector? We have seen in Europe um, a, um, a crisis mode since last autumn. Um, since last autumn, the prices were unsustainably high, and that created some kind of excitement into the new investment opportunities. So everything that could bring prices down is uh, much needed, and renewables, of course, are the answer. So what we are doing in Europe um, is um, trying to well, replace fossil fuels with renewables if we can. Unfortunately, it takes time. And, uh, and we can lead by example how to well, create local ownership so that permitting and installing new solar panels or well, wind parks would not uh, end up in the legal disputes because local communities are well um, worried that it uh, competes with other, other industrial or well, economic uh, sectors. This is one of our work streams just to well, um, present best practices, how to take local communities on board. And I think that this is also ne necessary for, uh, for global outreach, because we know that one day when we are getting rid of uh, fossil fuels, we still need to import. We need to import uh, green gases, green hydrogen, and that means that our neighbors, our trusted trading partners, uh, need to well produce wind and solar so that, uh, that there is a, a, a um, um, necessary energy available to produce uh, hydrogen. On top of that, we know that uh, one day when we are um, um, climate neutral, hopefully before 2050, but at least um, the deadline for us is 2050, 
uh, we need uh, more um, technologies that are market ready yet. So these are existing new technologies, but they are just too expensive. They cannot compete right now against the fossil fuels. And uh, this is a sector where Europe is investing a lot. In Europe, we do have a, a price for carbon. We are collecting um, money from polluters, and then we are re redirecting these funds under innovation fund to the, to the um, well, promising, uh, promising uh, um, technological uh, solutions, being it um, clean hydrogen, but also carbon capture and storage. And, uh, and tidal and wave energy that all might help us um, in the next decade to achieve our climate neutrality in in sustainable way and uh, and in affordable uh, way. Thank you. I don't know if someone has a response on the panel. Otherwise, perhaps in the in the room, I don't know if, if, if there are any questions for the panelists. I've got two, one here, uh, three, one, two, and. So maybe Olivia. Um, okay, we can start over here and the lady in the corner, and then the lady in the front, and then uh, the lady in the front. Yes. yes. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you, Pamela. It's really fascinating to discuss, and I'm so happy to see the effects of the Institute for Environmental Management and Assessment. Today, of course, is Water and Gender Day. What do you think that women? Thank you very much. Maybe we'll take the second question. We'll, 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 we'll take three, I think. The lady in the front in the purple top. Yes, thank you. It's a great conversation. Just have this impressive thing to come and do it. You know, what did you do? That's what it's been normal. We started working to promote inclusion as a partner to the existing and grow in the global energy sector. And as, and as a part of this, every single comment that we have made today on the panel, um, the test I have is uh, there's a sense that, that if we keep moving along the lines that are brought us to today, which is a fossil based economy, doesn't mean fossil the villain, it just means that that's what our old energy source always was. So now that we're moving to a non resource, an economic uh, focus and one that has equity for all, potentially. How do we set that up in both cities? And how do we, instead of going on a linear path, how do we incentivize all of the different uh, engagements, efforts, and technologies moving forward at the same time? Because we missed our deadline for a linear Thank you. One more, one more in the in the round, and then we'll do another round after. No. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you speak up a bit? Thanks for the great Thank you. And maybe we start quickly with that one, Gonzalo, and also maybe on the point about the systemic integration. How do we ramp it up? And then we'll, we'll take uh, that I, question. I will answer very fast to that because there is a lot of this is a bottleneck at the industry nowadays. So we are doing a great effort collaborating alliances, you know, with universities, with small technical people, you know, that install. Uh, but we are working in alliances with uh, international labor organization at the local level. So it's one of, of the areas that is now a bottleneck and we are working, working a lot. I, I, I can share with you different experiences afterwards, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Would, would, would you like to respond to any of these points that we've just mentioned here? I mean, I'd like to take up the, the, the point about building equity into the into transitions. 
because um, I think we need to recognize that today's energy crisis has distributional effects. It hits the vulnerable hard, and that's true within societies, and it's true internationally as well. And there is a clear role for policy to make up that deficit. I'm very struck by analysis that I've seen, not just on the very worrying statistics on people who are pushed into energy poverty by today's high fuel prices, but also the number of households who feel that they don't have the ability to change their energy circumstances. They, the solutions that we all know about that we've mentioned, better insulation, heat pumps, electrification, solar, whatever it is, they are somehow not within reach. And I think we also need to recognize that many of these solutions are relatively capital intensive. So you need to find capital up front and then you get the benefits over a long period of time. And we are moving out of an era of cheap money into a world of rising borrowing costs. And so it is going to become more difficult in some cases to, to implement some of these solutions. Um, so there is a very strong role for then public policy to step in and help people manage those upfront costs of, of, of things that will insulate them against the next crisis or volatility in fuel down the road. Indeed, and of course that has a strong gender component in terms of how we protect households and families in the next energy moment. Debbie, you have the, the response as well. I just want to, uh, to reply about the uh, women and water, and I, I think you pose a very good question, actually a question that was up in our board uh, a number of years ago. Um, that there, was, uh, there was an urge to do something more for women in combat poverty. It was when the SDGs were being discussed, and uh, we, we tried uh, to, uh, to venture into uh, microfinance, which is actually women, water projects, uh, and, and a lot of other uh, very good projects. And it's been a really good investment for PKA, and it's a story, story we love to, to tell. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Commissioner, did you have a response to some of these questions? Or, um, I do understand that we have time limits, but, uh, but uh, if you have a free moment in the afternoon, then you are most invited um, to participate in our EU Energy Day. And there you see that we really do have uh, impressive panels uh, and lots of uh, women because uh, we do know that uh, in Europe, in the renewable sector, you find um, more women than in old uh, well, fossil fuel um, um, industry. And, uh, and in the afternoon, we will have a panel uh, dedicated to green hydrogen, and there will be also Dr. Abu Zaid, uh, African Energy Commissioner, and my colleague participating. And on water, well, in Europe, uh, hydropower and uh, offshore wind represents a vast potential for renewables. But on top of that, there is also water that uh, needs to be uh, cleaned, wastewater. And just a couple of weeks ago, we presented a, a strategy how to make wastewater um, facilities, um, it, it, how to bring them up in that shape that they will produce more renewable gases than they consume at energy. And this is also a potential where we do hope that there is no public resistance because everybody understands that you need to clean your water and if you can produce methane out of it, then uh, this ticks all the boxes necessary. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know how if you have a quick comment, otherwise we can take one or two quick questions and then we'd be delighted to have Maria to give some closing remarks. So. Now maybe a quick comment on the finance. We all know that the way we, the, that we power our economy today is, is more expensive than any alternative solution. So I think we should also look at, <coughs> at service-based business models. So we have a service-based business model look called lighting as a service, but I think also utilities should be pushed, let's say voluntary and mandatory, to become energy service providers. So they can actually pre-finance on the energy bill those transitions for households and maybe even uh, for private sector and for, for cities. Uh, so that's one comment. And maybe one thing we could expand on uh, in, in the remaining time is also how can we focus on the health and well-being benefits? Because we're now all talking the rational stuff, like carbon, money, energy. But I think if people would understand how this would be good for their health and well-being, uh, then they would also express more support in, through their voting and buying behavior. So I think that the health aspect, people aspect is something yeah, that we should all search for. Thank you. Um, very quick question um, from Maxine and the front. Thank you. 
good uh, cement mask studio from Spian Company. We do post-it notes, but also uh, many products for fiscal uh, system, uh, decarbonization, and the energy that we use. First, it's all for the coming cement because you are running this afternoon and we are very happy to have you here. Congratulations for what you, what you do with the European School. First thing. Uh, second, the second thing is we have the transition to the next one, the next sector we are, but also with a great deal. Really, a technology company would tell you, um, please, let's show that we have the objective, but we allow all technologies for a while, you know, yeah. because we need the transition. I think that's important. Uh, so, uh, so it's a smart time for the green sure. industry. I put that to you, but it's kind of bad. You tell us a lot of things, like what is still interesting? What do you dream in a perfect world? What is this thing? I'm really sorry, but you have to. Uh, it, is it a quick question? It's a, it's a quick question. So, for now, there is a problem with the energy minister's decision. Yeah. My question is you talked about exchanging the technical low carbon fuel. How do you think it's a good thing? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. And it's a good thing. Yeah. And there is a fantastic. Then a quick response on your dream, and then I'd like to bring up Maria. So, what's, what's your dream, and um, as per Maxine's question? Well, my dream is that uh, we can. Um, scale up the energy savings because uh, we cannot uh, produce uh, sufficient volumes of renewables to replace all the fossil fuels. And we do have lots of buildings that just don't, uh, well, don't keep uh, the heat sufficiently indoors, uh, so renovating them will give us uh, amazing savings. Now about uh, um, um, nightmares, um, right now in Europe, Next to our border, there is a war, and the Russian military is occupying the biggest European nuclear power plant. So this is a nightmare. It should never be, be accepted. And, uh, and until the border withdrawal of Russian troops from civil nuclear sites, we cannot uh, rest peacefully. And, and now on electricity and uh, cable interconnections, subsea interconnections, we do have some of them already. But indeed, better interconnected regional electricity markets allow us to accommodate more renewables. And this is one of our priorities. We are building cross-border interconnections to uh, connect our member states, but also to connect us with our closest neighborhood, also with uh, this uh, Mediterranean region. Thank you. Um, so now I'm delighted to welcome uh, Maria Mendelice, uh, she's the CEO of Women Business. Um, coalition and we work very closely together and in fact I'm sure we'd be delighted to talk about the ambition list and also the exciting business support for the really critical questions right now at the top. So with Thank no you. further ado I'll pass to Maria. Thank you. It's a big pleasure to be in this meeting. Thank you CLG. CLG is one of our founding partners and it's been the, the in my view one of the biggest bri drivers for climate ambition in Europe in the business community. And Ursula is the star. We have Elliot as well, but we love Ursula because she is the leading woman on this uh, Women Day. So we have several crises. Uh, so we have the nature, climate, energy, a big nature crisis, and a people crisis. Maybe that people crisis is not so present, but it's growing. And so, you know, my, my, my first uh, comment or recommendation to the European Union is to take care of those people. As you are managing now the energy transition, make sure that the most vulnerable have the help they need to move and to get the equipment they need to be more efficient if they do. It is not about giving money, it's about giving savings in the future. But let me move on. So, <clears throat> the current energy crisis is a big push for the energy transition. I don't need to tell you, it's so straightforward. But why, if it's so straightforward that renewables 
and energy efficiency are the solution. Why are we talking so much about gas? I don't know. I don't understand. It's going to take so long to build gas infrastructure. We better hurry up with permitting of renewables because this is local. We will not be reinforcing the problems uh, that got us here. The second thing, scaling, scaling renewables and energy efficiency need many things. But the most important, we already have it, that renewables and energy efficiency are competitive. But we need to accelerate the permitting processes. We need to have the skills in Europe. We need to train thousands and thousands of people that will transition from some industries to be, you know, the ones that will be delivering these solutions. We need to change regulation. Regulation has been set up for many years for a world where we have a lot of resources and a lot of fossil fuels. But that's not, you know, the world that we want. And that means regulation that comes at every single level. Not only at, at EU level, that congratulations, you're doing a great job. But when it comes to national and local uh, regulation, we have miles to go. And that's where the implementation is happening. Third, we need to stop subsidies to fossil fuel and to anything that will support fossil fuel consumption. This might not be a big issue for Europe, but it's a huge issue in the world. I, I saw six trillion US dollars going to fossil fuel subsidies today, and that's increasing. That's outrageous. I get really upset. That money needs to be channeled to where it's most needed to help the most vulnerable commu communities. Fourth, when we look at sustainability, we, if we don't integrate that with the digitalization, we're not going to exploit the full potential of the transformation of business and societies. Digitalization and sustainability go hand in hand because digitalization is going to help us to be much more smart in the use of resources. Resources that at the end, they always need energy. And fifth, you know, we must go all in for 1.5. We just released a statement last, last Saturday because we are hearing that some parties, you know, might want maybe to put off the table 1.5. And the business community were really tired. We already agreed on 1.5 in Paris. We agreed in Glasgow. We don't need to be discussing 1.5 in every single COP. 1.5 is the limit. It's not the target. Many companies that have signed this statement, no, all the companies, because we only allow those companies that have set the science based target to sign the statement. Those companies are aligning their, comp their action plans to reduce emissions aligned with 1.5 because this is what the science is telling that companies need to do. If governments change that target and don't make it a limit, they are confusing the companies. And why is it important? We have 9,300 companies that have committed to science-based targets. 5,000 of those are SMEs. If the governments have doubts, it's sending the, sending the wrong signal to companies. We work with leading companies, companies that are taking those uh, targets with a lot of courage and not knowing about all the solutions that will give them, bring them to those targets, but they have the courage to say, we are going to do it. And those companies are cleaning the way so that other companies follow. The only way that other companies follow, the leading companies, is, is it, it's only if regulation, it is aligned with it. So the business community wants to give policymakers the confidence that business says that we can do it, that 1.5 is the limit. Today is Women's Day, okay? So women are going to be the ones that are going to be most impacted by climate change, and we know that. And as a women, and as the many women, but also as the many men on the room, because this is not a women thing, you know, we absolutely need to fight so that loss and damage is not an issue, so that we mitigate the emissions so much and we prepare with our companies, you know, to adapt to the existing uh, climate change so that um, many women, children, elder, and those that are more affected will have uh, every chance to, you know, to succeed and to thrive 
in the world that we want. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria, and uh, thank you for all your support to Sophia Europe and the work that we do. I think with no further ado, I'd like to just finish up by thanking our, our panelists. Please, a round of applause for the panelists. We really appreciate all your input today. And uh, we, we really fully support the All In for 1.5 statement. I think it's really time to, to scale up our action and move. I think, as, as Simon Steele said, even before the conference started, it's all about ramping up our action now, not giving up on the limit of 1.5. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish you um, useful negotiations in this place to come. Thank you.